Welcome to Conversations on the Future of Democracy, a series sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. I'm Jana Dietz. I direct outreach and partnerships for the Kluge Center. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Melvin Rogers and Jack Turner, authors of the newly released book, African American Political Thought, A Collected History. Dr. Rogers is a political theorist at Brown University. He has written The Undiscovered Dewey, Religion, Morality, and Ethos of Democracy, and he was a distinguished visiting scholar here at the Kluge Center, where he completed this book project. Also joining us today is Jack Turner of the University of Washington, co-editor of this new volume. Dr. Turner is a political scientist with specialties in race, political thought, and intellectual history. His works include Awakening to Race, Individuals, and Social Consciousness in America. We're excited to discuss their new book today, a collection of 30 influential thinkers who've shaped African-American political thought, ranging from Phyllis Wheatley to Cornell West. So again, welcome, and let's get started. At the library, we enjoy hearing about the journey books take to reach their readers. Melvin and Jack, how did this project come about? Well, it's a project that really sort of grew out of our friendship. We uh, were both undergraduates at Amherst College in the mid to late 1990s, and we actually met in a class on philosophy, race, and racism uh, taught by uh, one of our contributors, Robert Gooding Williams, who was an important teacher to both of us. And uh, and we, we met in that class. That really sort of started a, a, a really important intellectual friendship between us. Uh, we love talking about the history of political thought. Uh, we loved especially talking about the history of American philosophy. And over time, you know, as that friendship grew, we really uh, learned to love talking about African-American political thought between us. And eventually it occurred to us that uh, one thing that was sort of missing in our field of political science sort of a, a, a survey of, of this tradition and what it meant because we, we sense it was really integral uh, but we, we we wanted to try to get a, a full and clear picture of it and so we, we started to work on this project together. Melvin would you like to add? No I actually think I think that's spot on I think that's spot on yeah. Well let's let's turn our attention to the significance of the title of this work. Um, you use the phrase collected history and uh, that's approach that uh, you use for a particular reason as a methodology. Um, can you explain a little bit about why you use that and what it can teach us about the field of African-American political thought? Sure, I'll be delighted to, to say a word about that. Um, I should also thank you on behalf of Chip and myself um, and the Library of Congress for, for hosting this. We appreciate it a great, a great deal. Um, so the collected history approach and the reason why we sort of use that uh, language is that we wanted to uh, get readers to uh, focus on the sort of distinctiveness of the individual lives of the African-American thinkers that we uh, that we survey. And we wanted to use the book as an opportunity to pull out uh, for the readers the distinctive philosophical, political philosophical contributions that they make um, to our moral and political thinking. But even as, you know, even as we sort of deploy the language of collective history to sort of focus on these individual lives, we also try to say in the introduction and throughout the book, through the various contributors, um, that all of these figures are grappling with and are confronting with racial disregard and they're confronting white supremacy. And that that actually uh, sort of binds them together um, historically across across time. And I think the last point I would make on this sort of collected history approach is that, look, there's a lot of philosophical traditions uh, out there that our discipline has paid a lot of attention to, uh, among which includes, let's say, for example, the social contract tradition, which is a tradition uh, out of the, the 17th and 18th century that focuses on, you know, what are the rules and criteria for building a political society? But in focusing on things like that, one of the things we have missed are a set of different kinds of questions. You know, what does it mean to live a good life under conditions of domination? What does it mean to engage in uh, protest and contestation in a society in which you are uh, devalued and not recognized as an equal? And so part of what this book does through the language of a collective history is put those tape, those questions back on the 
back on the table or on the table uh, 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 in, in a significant way for our profession for the first time. Part and of I think this, uh, mm -hmm. excuse me. The, um, the, the, the indefinite article at the front does a lot of work. Mm -hmm. You know, when we say a collective history, we're not saying that this is the collective history. We're saying this is a provocation uh, to the study of this tradition. And we hope that, you know, our peers and, you know, our, our, our students uh, eventually sort of put up their own sort of rival visions of what this tradition means. And so this book, we, we hope it's going to, we hope it'll have shelf life, but we also see it as a conversation starter. Yes. Mm -hmm. The individuals that you feature in this volume span um, disciplines and span a, a great deal of time, um, and that there are still some very consistent themes that run across uh, these essays. And one of that, uh, one of those themes is that of a just society. The term social justice, for example, features prominently in current policy discussions and public discourse uh, at the moment. Um, how can we better understand the meaning of a just society by applying concepts from African American political thought? Um, are there certain individuals in this book that can deepen our understanding uh, of, of that concept and, um, in fact, even challenge that? So, I mean, so this is a very, you know, this is a big question. Um, and in some sense, uh, one wants to uh, journey through uh, the book to get the sort of full vision of what a just society looks like on the view of these different thinkers. But, but perhaps... Uh, you know, perhaps I would take us to a couple of a, a couple of figures, right? So, if we think about um, uh, uh, let's think about 19th century thinkers. Let's think about David Walker, uh, Martin Delaney, uh, and Frederick Douglass, all of whom are taken up in this in this in this book. And I'll say a word about each. So, uh, 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 so David Walker um, is the basis for chapter two, the chapter that I wrote. Um, and part of what Walker is uh, doing in the 19th century, he wrote an important pamphlet uh, in uh, 1829, then revised it in eight, for 1830. Uh, and part of what Walker is doing in that, uh, in that extraordinary document called uh, Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World is trying to get his readers to see that, that in order for one to enjoy freedom, it requires you not to be at the arbitrary mercy of your fellows. Whether, whether the fellows that, that actually have you in chains in the South uh, or those who look on in uh, contempt and disgust in the North and we're in the 19th century. And so part of what he wanted to insist on was that freedom is really about uh, not being at the arbitrary mercy of your fellows, not being dominated. But, but then it raises a question, okay, well, well if it's, a, it's about not being dominated, then that's the hallmark of what a just society is about. Well, how do you achieve it? And so Martin Delaney, the famous, the famous Black abolitionist writing in the 1850s, uh, this is the chapter written by the political philosopher Bob Gooding Williams. And in that chapter, Delaney insists that to, ha to, to not be at the arbitrary mercy of another really requires you to have a share in, in political society. This is what he called uh, in his work, the sovereign principle. It means that you are able to participate in giving direction to, to, your, to your social life and to the community to which you belong. And I think finally, Frederick Douglass, uh, we have a wonderful chapter on Frederick Douglass from Sharon Krause, a political theorist here at Brown University. And part of what Douglas insists is that if freedom is about avoiding domination, if it's about having a share in political life, then what that really means is that freedom is not merely about individual will or initiative. It's also about belonging to a community that has put in place material and social resources. That is to say, a community that actually supports you. So on this account, to live in a just society involves not being at the arbitrary mercy of another, sharing in the direction of the political community, and uh, and and feeling that one can depend on the social supports of uh, of of that community. Jack, would you like to add anything there? I, well, I, I mean that was masterful explication by by uh, Melvin. 
And uh, yeah, these these themes of, of domination and of freedom and of what the meaning of freedom is. And one of the things I think that we really emphasize in introduction is that the definitions of freedom coming out of the African-American tradition of political thought are very distinct from those coming out of the Euro-American tradition. Uh, these conceptions of freedom have a more communalist focus. Uh, they have a much more focus on activity. Uh, they have much of, more of a focus on insurgency and movement. Uh, and in a, the way in which freedom is a actually a process of transformation and not a static state. So one of the things that we want to, you know, really emphasize with, with this volume is that the ideas coming out of the African American political tradition, they're not just variations of Euro-American traditions. They are complete reconfigurations and distinct contributions that I think that we neglect to our impoverishment and sometimes even to our peril. Jack, one of those um, uh, themes also is that of relationality and, and how that fits with uh, equality. Um, could you explain a little more about that, for example? Yeah, the, the theme of relationality, it sort of really begins to emerge. I think it's, it's, it, it covers many different chapters, but I think it, it starts to really emerge strongly in uh, chapter eight, a, a, a chapter on Anna Julia Cooper by Caroline White, where she talks about uh, Cooper's radical relationality and the way in which she conceived of individual freedom is always being in, nested within inner relationships. And that we could not attend to individual freedom without also attending to the relational whole of society. And so she talked about this inter interdependence, this ongoing interdependence between uh, the one and the all. And she conceived of social and political progress as a way of, of bringing the one and the all into equilibrium. And we see this also continued, I think, in a, a chapter that I wrote on Audre Lorde, whose politics of difference is very much nested within an idea of relational equality. Equality not as a distribution of goods, but equality as a form of social relationship. And um, re the other thing I think you really get uh, within the African-American tradition especially in contrast to the social contract tradition that Melvin referred to earlier, social contractarianism, you know, it tends to focus on an ontology of individuals who um, are contractually related to each other. And if they all get what they are due, then society is going to be stable and just. Uh, I think the African-American tradition has an emphasis, uh, different emphasis. It, the emphasis is on the way in which we are in ongoing relationship with each other that constantly have to be tended to, that are constantly undergoing transformation. And that if we, unless we attend to this relational component of democratic life, then our society is gonna be more characterized by uh, indifference and neglect. And it won't have, and this is a theme that Melvin emphasizes a lot, uh, the proper relationships of care that are necessary to keep a democratic community going. Mm -hmm. I'm really what, struck by, mm -hmm. I just want—I want to add that 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 that, that um that emphasis on relationality. It's 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 uh, something that's distinctive to the African American tradition. But I really want to—I think it's important to emphasize it's a distinctively Black feminist contribution. And so uh, I think, and that Black feminist uh, contribution is uh, really crucial to the configuration of the entire tradition. When you when you think about um, the concept of care, which you just mentioned. Uh, with regard to uh, the relationality um, uh, and connection and community, um, I'm really curious to get your thoughts on where you think the concept of trust fits in. Um, right now, we're at a moment where we have lack of trust in our governmental institutions, our processes, um, trust within, you know, between uh, each of us uh, within our larger community. So could you weigh in on where that might fit in as well? So, I mean, this is a very interesting question because in some sense, um, uh, I think Chip would agree with this. I mean, in some sense, uh, the entirety of the tradition, whether explicitly or implicitly, is grappling with um, uh, a trust deficit, right? I mean, right, it, mm -hmm. it, it is, right, There, we have a condition of um, a, a domination of, of, of disregard, um, and it is a it is a context in which 
um, black people uh, have good reason not to sort of trust uh, political society and their fellows at all. But one of the things that I think cuts through all of, of these essays in different form is precisely how central trust is to the health of a democratic society. And that there are some of us that are able to take it for granted because they uh, are already rightly positioned uh, and there are others of us that, uh, that that can't. But part of what the tradition wants to insist is that it is at the heart of a proper functioning uh, uh, a democratic society. And the way you get to trust, right, is through building it, uh, through uh, the processes of relationality that, uh, uh, that Chip uh, had already uh, outlined or has already outlined. And, and, and I should say, the reason why I'm, one of the things that's quite, I think, significant about this is that for the African-American thinkers uh, and for the tradition, they take it as settled that democracy is about managing the shared life. And they take it as settled. And because they take that as settled, there is no way to pull apart the managing of a shared life with a focus on cultivating trust relationships. And that's a very different kind of analysis uh, that I think you get in um, the sort of contractual model, um, because even if there's a deficit of trust, the thought is that the legal institutions will intervene to ensure um, that people comport themselves in the right way towards you in the context of a, uh, uh, of a contractual relationship. It's very different, very different model in the context of African-American political thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the trust issue comes out especially in, in Danielle Allen's chapter uh, on Ralph mm -hmm. Ellison, um, because one of the things that she's really focusing on is that democratic community, is, as she conceives of it, it always involves sacrifice, sacrifice by some members of the community on behalf of other members of the community. OK, so the example that she gives is, uh, say, when um, the Fed raises interest rates in order to uh, keep inflation under control, usually the, the consequence of that is uh, going to be a rise in unemployment. And usually a rise in employment is always going to hit black and brown communities before it hits white communities. Now, she concedes that sometimes this is necessary in order, for, in order to uh, uh, manage a contemporary community that thinks like managing inflation. There are legitimate policy questions. For, for Allen, though, and for Allen's vision of Edison, the question is, what do you do for those who bear the sacrifice? How do you compensate those who bear the sacrifice? How do you take care of those political remainders? And her thesis is that, is that when one portion of the community, like African Americans, have been asked to bear a disproportionate share of sacrifice, that generates mistrust. And then that mistrust destabilizes the polity. The other place, I mean, I think the trust issue also comes up in Lord somewhat, because there's on the one hand the trust issue that happens within the larger political community, but part of what black politics is about, it's about a practice of coalition. It's about a practice of a uh, coalitional movement for transformation. And one question that comes is how do you build trust within a coalition? Uh, because as someone, uh, you know, Bernice Johnson Reagan, a very uh, important uh, black feminist theorist, uh, you know, emphasizes that building coalition, it's a painful process. And building the trust that is necessary in a uh, coalition, uh, it takes work and it takes vulnerability. And as a result of that, um, but you need trust within coalition in order for coalitions to be effective. So I think the trust issue, it comes up within um, the larger question of Black folks' relationship to uh, the white uh, uh uh, the white community, but it also is an issue within the black community, especially bet between, say, between black men and black women, between uh, 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 black lesbians, black gay men, and straight black people, uh, that there are issues, internal issues of trust that also have to be addressed in order to act effectively in a political sphere. I mean, one of the things, if I can get in on this, I mean, one of the things mm -hmm. that's interesting here um, is that as much as we see um, Ellison um, and we see Lord um, meditating on the issue of trust, you know, we should not 
be led to believe that all African American thinkers in this volume um, are in agreement about whether or not the American polity, broadly speaking, uh, is up to the task of fulfilling the demand that trust places on us. So for example, if you think about uh, chapter 26, this is a chapter on, on Stokely Carmichael, um, uh, 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 who is an amazing thinker in his own right and an activist, um, uh, the sort of chairperson of a SNCC uh, student nonviolent uh, coordinating uh, committee. And of course, this chapter is written by uh, uh, Brandon Terry. And part of what we come to see in focusing on Carmichael is that Carmichael is asking African Americans in his endorsement of Black power to think about what it means for us to attend to our own community precisely because there is an absence of trust and there is no good reason to believe, given all the history that Black people had experienced, there's no good reason to believe that the American polity can be shamed into um, uh, sort of recognizing the demands that trust uh, uh, places on them and uh, the demand that trust places on uh, any society. And so Carmichael in some sense being extremely uh, suspicious and skeptical that uh, uh, his white counterparts are up to the task, um, encourages a kind of a participatory politics, a kind of localism in which black folks will attend to uh, their own communities and build trust within, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's a form of trust that's being built within over and against, right? Um, mm -hmm. Acknowledgement um, that we actually cannot uh, get on with trust in our with trust in our white counterparts. Um, can I ask a question about maybe how um, uh, elected and appointed representation fits in with trust? Do you feel that there's a role? We've seen so many um, new firsts uh, just uh, in the past few years. Uh, certainly with uh, Kamala Harris becoming the first vice president, uh, African American, Asian American background. Um, so again, is this um, is this, does this play a role in building trust, being able to see those in positions of political power uh, that um, have um, uh, the shared experience? Huge, huge question. I mean, if you look at, say, Paul Taylor's chapter on Du Bois, who, you know, in some ways is, is the greatest, you know, thinker in the African-American uh, tradition. I mean, one thing that um, Du Bois really, emphasized was a need for leaders to be accountable to uh, uh, their constituency and their need to respond to criticism. And so the issue of leadership has, has been, you know, a huge uh, question in um, the in the history of African-American politics. But one of the themes that I think sort of comes out of the tradition is that it's not the election of, of leadership itself that's important. It's not uh, the election of one of us that's important. It's an ongoing relationship that happens afterwards. And the relationship of uh, of criticism, of responsiveness, and of trust. And that that is an ongoing work. It's not something that occurs uh, only at election. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, um, uh, I mean, Chip hits it. I mean, he hit it right on the, on the head there. I think this symbolic representation um, is of little significance. I don't want to say it's insignificance, but it's of little significance if it is not bound to a kind of politics that directs itself to, um, to showing care and concern uh, for, uh, for Black folks. Um, so, so someone like, you know, Bayard Rustin, you know, this is chapter 19 written by George Schumann. I mean, Bayard Rustin, uh, you know, we're in the 1960s, the great strategist of, one of the great strategists of the civil rights movement. Um, and in 1965, he makes a shift from insisting on protesting to a focus on coalition building, trying to um, uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of insinuate oneself into uh, party building um, and sort of uh, sort of de-emphasizing uh, racial divisions 
and playing up class commonality. Uh, but even for all of his emphasis on party building, uh, ultimately, Black representation is meaningless if, it, uh, if it's not tied to the thing for which those representatives or why they are, right, why they are sent to, um, to serve in the first place. Um, and for him, that was about a kind of racial equality. It was, a kind of, it was about a kind of economic, a kind of economic uh, justice. And those things will always have to be tested uh, and measured across time. And one thing I would add to that, I mean, I think the, the Bayard Rustin chapter, which is also nested in there with chapters, you know, on um, on King and on Carmichael, is I think one thing that especially emerges is from those chapter is is sort of the concept that you know there's a political uh, there's a political division of labor um, that uh, protest and politics are things that work in tandem to, with each other that um, that elected officials they actually need protest in order to create the the popular pressure that allows them that creates openings within their institutions to take bold action um, and so. Uh, so I think that one thing that emerges from the volume is that it's not an either or model. Mm -hmm. It is um, uh, rather, a, you know, a both and model where we are both creating popular pressure through uh, coalitional action in the streets and at the same time uh, taking opportunities to act within institutions when those opportunities are available and also expanding the space of possibilities within those institutions as a result. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so there's sort of an ongoing call and response um, uh, between uh, institutional politics and uh, street democratic politics. Mm -hmm. Another strength of this book that, that I was um, also struck by was that just the variety of, of the backgrounds from which uh, these individuals are represented so that we have folks that are coming from a from um, poetry, from literature, from philosophy, uh, from other forms of activism and expression. And I uh, would be interested to know if there are additional areas uh, where you think we see thought leaders that could also influence um, African political thought um, in this, in, uh, currently. I mean, I think one thing that we, we, we did as we sort of conceptualized the volume, we wanted there to be a diversity of genre. Uh, cause, and actually that's part of the claims of the book is that African-American political thought has taken um, a multiplicity of genres uh, ranging from, yes, you, you have some philosophical treatises, but you also have political pamphlets, autobiographies, sermons, satires, Supreme Court opinions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one thing I, I wish that... Uh, you know, we, we, we had done um, is, is we also, I wish we had more um, incorporated music. Uh, so for example, like having a chapter on someone like Billie Holiday or Public Enemy who have tremendous political significance in their work. Um, but, but I think we still do get that diversity of genre when we we have someone like, you know, uh, the, the book is dedicated to our former teacher, Jeff Ferguson, um, who taught us at Amherst College uh, in the late 1990s. And his chapter on George Schuyler, who's mostly known as sort of a political uh, political co a conservative, black conservative political commentator from the mid 20th century. It's really focused on a satirical work in a book called Black No More. And what Ferguson is dealing with is how can the American sort of racial psychosis be best approached through the genre of comedy? through the genre of uh, well, tragic comedy, if you will, that is it possible that the genre of uh, comedy and tragic comedy uh, can uh, better disclose the absurdity of the American racial situation than more earnest uh, forms of address can do so. And so that focus on diversity of genres is actually one of sort of the main highlights of the book. Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite important. You know, it, it, the title of the book is African American Political Thought of Collected History. And immediately when you have the terms political thought, uh, you immediately have in your mind um, uh, a certain kind of thing that you will encounter. Um, and one of the, one of the important uh, sort of features of this book, and this is part of what Chip is emphasizing here, that we wanted to press um, is the ways in which what counts as political thought 
from the perspective of African Americans um, is a sort of diverse and heterogeneous uh, thing. And this is because in a society in which you do not enjoy equal standing and in which you're devalued, you now have to find the various spaces, whatever those spaces are, and whatever the medium turns out to be uh, in order to grapple uh, with that condition. Amira Baraka, who's not in the book, you know, famously said he was talking about African-American music. And he, he, and he says that the Negro's music, um, it must be understood, issue from the Negro's uh, social environment. One might say um, that everything in some sense that has been uh, uh, penned by African-Americans has issued from that social condition. And in issuing from that social condition, it always finds itself trying to figure out, trying to make sense, just how is it the case that a society that claims to be democratic is so complicit in uh, these forms of uh, uh, the various practices of domination and violence that are committed against Black, Black people. And so now the music, the literature, the art, the philosophy, properly speaking, all bears that mark. And to the extent that it all bears that mark, it all can be a subject for political thought. There's so many interesting issues raised uh, in this collection. Um, is there, I know this can be sometimes a difficult question to answer, but is there a particular takeaway or something that you want the readers to know when they finish uh, going through this collection of, of, of 30 essays uh, and their range? Well, I don't think there's a substantive takeaway, but I think that, you know, uh, the first thing that I think Melvin and I really want from the book is we want the book to help send readers back to the primary text and to uh, read them in a new light through a new set of theoretical lenses that this book has introduced and help them see things uh, that are there that they may not have seen before. We also really hope that it's a book that's assigned. And if you'll excuse the plug, it's very recently priced at $35, <laughs> uh, which we hope can, um, uh, we hope will enable teachers to use it in their classrooms um, so that uh, undergraduate students, uh, graduate students, even high school students uh, can um, get a sense of what's at stake and what the inner life of this tradition is uh, so that they can sort of develop um, a taste for it and yearn to learn more. Melvin, would you like to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think you know, again, um, uh, Chip is right here. You know, the other thing I would, I would add to that is, is, is that at this present moment where we sit historically, as we are grappling with um, the history of protest movements, uh, as we're grappling with a history of racial disregard that continues to live into the present, we find ourselves groping for a language. We find ourselves groping for a vocabulary. We find ourselves groping for a tradition. This book is the tradition. This book is the vocabulary to grapple with the moment in which we find ourselves. If we would only listen and read um, and walk through, uh, move through, uh, the text. So I think that the book is uh, enriching in a scholarly way, but I also think that it's enriching in the sense of giving us a way of talking about the tradition that we all can lay claim to and that we can deploy as we continue to the extent that we're committed to it, as we continue to struggle to realize justice um, and democracy. Yeah, and, and what Melvin said there, it actually reminds me, you know, the last chapter is on um, on uh, Cornell West by mm -hmm. Mark Wood. And um, uh, I was in a seminar with Cornell West uh, shortly after 9-11. And it was actually on African-American intellectual history. And he says, here we are, you know, in the aftermath of this great terror attack on the United States. And people are wondering, you know, how do you live in the shadow of terror? And he said that the entire tradition of black thought in America America is a resource on how to live 
in the shadow of terror? And more importantly, how to respond to terror without losing your humanity? Mm-hmm. And that, uh, it, I mean, that was a, a rem- huge moment in my education. Um, but it's also, it was, it was sort of pointing, Cornell was pointing to the ways in which this tradition is kind of a hidden treasure uh, mm-hmm. for dealing with um, many of the problems our democracy currently faces. And uh, and so part of what we hope the book is to sort of bring some of that treasure to the surface and mm-hmm. say it is a resource. Um, and it's a resource that everyone can benefit from. Well, Melvin and Jack, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you've left us with a lot to think about, and uh, we appreciate the time uh, to discuss this new book. It's fantastic, and uh, uh, we appreciate this, so uh, we hope to see you soon. Uh, take care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been an honor.